His energy industry career is rooted in Florida. From 1987 to 1997, he worked at West Florida Electric Cooperative. His tenure culminated there as Vice President of Member Services, Information Technology, Marketing, and Economic Development. Mr. Wynn also served 24 years as President and CEO of Roanoke Electric Cooperative in North Carolina and recently made the move to Seco Energy in Florida. Mr. Wynn is married to his wife, Celine, and they have three grown children. He holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Administration and Management Information Systems from Troy University. With a cooperative career that spans over 40 years, Mr. Wynn's resume reflects a long list of awards and accomplishments with creative solutions that are turning the challenges of the energy industry evolution into major opportunities. Service to other organizations is also inter is an integral part of Mr. Wynn's cooperative career history. He serves or has served on a variety of boards, including a media pass board president of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, past president, vice president, and secretary treasurer of the North Carolina Electric Membership Cooperative, board member, North Carolina's Association of Electric Cooperatives, board member, National Rural Utilities Cooperative Finance Corporation, CFC, board member, Meridian Cooperative, formerly SEDC, and past nominating committee member for CoBank. I need a breath. If I had to do all that, I would too. <laughs> Most recently, Mr. Wynn was awarded the Clyde T. Ellis Award from the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. This prestigious award honors those who have made exemplary contributions that permit the principles and progress of rural electrification and the development and use of natural resources. Mr. Wynn humbly credits his success to his family his board and former colleagues at Roanoke Electric, fellow NRECA directors and staff, and many friends across the cooperative network. To various chamber business leaders, please join me in welcoming CEO of Seco Energy, Curtis Wynn, to the podium. Thank you, thank you, Kathy, I appreciate that. Very kind introduction and good afternoon to all of you. Um, I am truly humbled and, and elated to, to join you here at your chamber lunch. Um, it's always good to watch as chamber members collaborate and, and, and coordinate with each other and network. That's, you can feel the activity in the room, so it's, it's very good to be here today. I am, again, I'm honored to have been chosen as the new Seco Energy CEO. As Kathy mentioned, I joined the organization officially on December 15th. And I appreciate the Board of Trustees there uh, for providing me the opportunity to serve the members of our growing and very dynamic not-for-profit cooperative. Uh, and speaking of Board of Trustees, I'm happy to introduce one of our trustees today representing members here in Lake County, uh, Mrs. Morgan Hatfield, please be recognized. I'm very fortunate to work with a very uh, knowledgeable and committed board of trustees. Uh, I will brag on Ms. Hatfield, uh, this, this industry is very educational intensive, uh, especially for someone who doesn't work in it every day. And, she has just finished a lot of the training that's necessary to be, a, be an effective trustee, getting what we call in the industry director goal and going through a series of, of trainings to make sure she understands what's happening in the industry. So I, I thank you for that. And thank you for being here with us today. Um, over the last decade, uh, SECO has been on a fast growth pace while operating an organization fiscally responsibly. Uh, this growth is occurring in all sectors, residential, commercial, and industrial. And I heard recently that Central Florida is, if not the, uh, it is one of the fastest growing regions in the nation. <clears throat> now, with the number of residents and 
businesses <clears throat> moving to Florida, we expect this expansion and uh, this de growing demand for power to be the norm for, for a while. Uh, the overall growth that I mentioned retains SECO's position as not the largest, but the third largest electric cooperative in Florida. Uh, and nationally, we're out of about 800 uh, distribution co-op cooperative, we hold seventh place. And that is in terms of the number of members that we serve uh, through our utility. The industry is, is really not short of significant challenges. Um, and SECO Energy is right among those who are involved with those challenges. Um, we continue to deal with one that I'll mention initially, and that is this, this whole issue around supply chain constraints. Uh, and there's a, we are in the, in the aftermath of a, of a very serious pandemic. Uh, we see these constraints that are causing periodic shortages of raw materials, of labor shortages, um, we have shipping delays, and then on top of that, where we are, there's an increasing demand for the products that we need to keep the lights on and the power flowing. And this is challenging our ability to operate. Uh, we see it, it, it's very tough from day to day to procure transformers, to get PVC pipe, meter boxes, and any equipment that relies on a microchip. And that's very tough to get these days. All of this has really caused us to change the way we operate. Uh, it's caused our inventory planning to go from what we used to do as a very highly efficient, just in time inventory methodology um, to today, we are in a mode of get it while you can, and get it if you can. Uh, and all of those things I just mentioned. And don't ask what the price is, by the way, because <laughs> nobody cares. Um, and that's where we are today. And this, this whole shift, is, it changes our whole business model uh, to one which we find ourselves operating around the available materials that we can get. So these constraints result in increased cost of inventory, obviously, and the price escalation that we're seeing today goes well beyond what you would see in normal inflation. However, as we do at SECO, given the domestic and, and global events causing these trends to continue, this, this hope um, is still fading, of, a, of it changing. During the earlier stages of this dilemma, SECO was able to absorb the immediate cost increases without negatively impacting the rates that our members pay in hopes of a quick recovery. But we don't see that happening. We, we have to prepare to meet these business targets and our member requests in an environment today that was totally different a year ago and is more challenging than it's ever been. So we're, we're anticipating the continuation of gradual increases, probably steep increases in costs, uh, supply chain interruptions, but ultimately, these factors, along with the normal increased cost of providing service, will result, without a doubt, will result in our members paying more for their energy needs, just as we find ourselves at SECO paying more for about everything we have to purchase. Just want to check the room. How many of you are SECO Energy members? Very good representation here. So thank you for your patronage, and thank you for being members of SECO Energy. Thank you. We appreciate you saying that. We, we think so, too, and I see a big smile on John LaSalva's place. Yes. Well, you might hear from a, one of the leaders of our, our team that's a lot responsible for that later. He's right here in front of me with the Thank time. You very much. <laughs> well, notwithstanding all of this, uh, as we do at SECO, we will strive, as, as we always do, to minimize this impact. We'll do what we can uh, to make sure that our members' rates, although they will probably increase, that they still remain affordable. And as you look broader than just SECO, we will work as hard as we can to make sure we remain competitive with those around us. Because this, this impact is not just impacting SECO, it's happening, happening pretty universally. <clears throat> now over the last year, I'm sure that you as, as chamber members have experienced challenges um, that this unprecedented growth has had on your city and, and this county uh, over this last several months. So in, in 2021, SECO Energy, as you talk about growth, we welcomed 2,000
38 new members who reside here in Lake County. Now this total, this total for, for Lake County is about 35% of our overall growth. And you're right in the middle between two other counties, between Sumter County and Marion County. Sumter grew at about 25%. Marion at about 37%. So you're right there in the pack in terms of growth. In 2021, Seco Energy added 5,770 meters across our entire system, which brought our total active meter or service count to 222,188. Our, our CFO uh, just informed me recently that in March, we added 808 new meters. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is a 15-year high in terms of growth in one month. So we're seeing it happening, and I, I always tell the team that the avalanche is way out there, but it's fast, fast approaching, and we're going to be seeing this type of growth. To reliably serve the homes and businesses throughout the region within, within our service area, our system is home to 48 substations and about 13,000 miles of line, 13,000. That's a lot of territory. To support the growth in, in our area and, in, and the increasing demand for energy, our investment in facilities has topped over $1 billion, with a B. Uh, this ongoing facilities investment averages over $6 million every month. Last year, SECO members consumed over 3.68 billion kilowatt hours of electric power. Now that is an increase of over 40 million compared to 2022. I mentioned the worldwide supply chain disruption earlier and its, its effect on SECO's operating model. Similarly, the domestic and global events and the resulting economics that I spoke about earlier have also driven oil prices up. They have been on the rise since early 2021, and residents and business owners are paying significantly more at the pump as a result. I, I saw this morning, I think the price of gasoline is about, for regular unlead is about $4.20 per gallon. And regrettably, the natural gas market is affected just like the oil market. Now, why do I mention that? Well, the Energy Information Administration estimates that the wholesale spot price of natural gas in 2022 will reach an eight-year high. And that market volatility, Chamber members, will affect the cost of our wholesale power providers, which is Seminole Electric and over in Tampa. It will impact their production of power. And ultimately, as we purchase from them, that will bleed down into the cost that we pay for power and ultimately to our members, and it'll, it'll re reflect on our members' bills. Now, some of you, for those members who are in the room, uh, with, with roughly 70 cents of every dollar we spend to purchase wholesale power, it is clear that this impact is, is already here. Now, members who read the SECO news and review, our, re review your electric bill each month, you've already seen a line item referred to as PCA, that stands for Power Cost Adjustment Factor. And this calculation allows SECO to adjust for the rise and fall of fuel prices or fuel costs in real time without formally going to the, the powers that be to ask for a rate increase. And this is common among utility practice. As a not-for-profit utility, what it what, more importantly, what it does is that it prevents the over and under collection of funds from consumers. We can adjust it to make sure we're charging the right amount based on the fuel volatility that we see. In April, the price of natural gas caused Seco's wholesale bill from Seminole to increase. Accordingly, as you might expect, this resulted in Seco's cost per thousand kilowatt hours to increase from $121 that it was in March to $128.05 that we saw in April. That's per thousand. Now, so another area is, is access to low cost capital, which is vital. It is vital with the growth and the major investments that SECO is making to keep up with the, the growth that we're seeing. And this growth is happening during a time of record inflation and rising cost of capital 
which really challenges our ability to maintain flat rates while we preserve reliable service. We're fortunate to have stable access to capital from the USDA uh, that stands for the USDA Rural Utility Services. That's our primary place where we go and borrow funds. And we also have three other very capable private lenders that we go to. So as we obtain this working capital, as well as the funding for many of the major projects that we're involved in, that is needed very much so to keep up with this growth and to maintain our existing facilities. However, we are all aware that the Federal Reserve, you've heard that they're anticipating several interest hikes this year. Now this has our attention at SECO since we know that SECO and its funders are not exempt from this cost, the cost impact that this policy will create. Another challenge that SECO has faced is recruiting talented folks to join our team. And additionally, as we grab, get people to join our team, retaining them from competitive forces is also a challenge once we get them hired. So as chamber members and professionals, I'm sure that you have faced some of those same challenges within your areas of business. But we, we also must have quality and stable contract labor, which we use quite a bit of. I think we have over 200 contract labor personnel on, on our team or on our staff are actually supporting our staff at this time. They support us in areas where we'd see it not feasible for us to go out and hire full-time employees to carry out certain operational functions, such as keeping the right-of-way clean. So SECO employee, uh, we employ contractors for trimming trees. Uh, we employ contractors for meeting, reading our meters. Uh, we have contractors doing facilities inspections for us. They look at underground and overhead line work, and, as, and the list goes on and on. We find that very a lot more feasible than hiring full-time employees to do that. Now, moving into the future and understanding the supply chain and labor issues, our Board of, Tr of Trustees has approved steps to embrace technology that will reduce our operating costs and improve reliability over time moving forward. We're wrapping up two pilot projects that have tested the viability of deploying advanced metering infrastructure. We call that AMI. And we're, putting, we're looking at how we can put that throughout our system. And the summation of those pilots is that the technology that we're, we're looking at, that we're considering, that may be a hybrid of different technologies, is solid. And the financial business case that we're looking at to make this investment is very strong. And with that information in mind, it was a, a, a very solid decision of our Board of Trustees to allow us to move forward. At this point, we're, just, we're preparing to decide on a vendor with whom we will work to deploy AMI technology that would help us improve our operations in a variety of ways. Currently, SECO pays contractors to read meters on the more than 220,000 homes and businesses across the seven counties that we serve. Because we, don't, we do not currently have AMI in place, advanced metering structure, infrastructure in place, this meter reading process and many of the other functions that we do are manual. And they're very costly, especially as we see the cost of labor, the cost of fuel soar to record levels. So while our investment in AMI will be significant, we anticipate a substantial return on that investment by eliminating the high cost of manually dispatching trucks and contracted employees to go read meters, the cost of restoring power when we have service interruptions, by reducing the time and the labor that it takes to detect and restore those power outages so we can keep that good response time. And the new technology will also allow SECO uh, to identify situations, believe this or not, folks steal electricity from us, and when that happens, this new technology will quickly detect when, when folks are stealing electricity. That's just three of many things we'll be able to do um, as we invest in this technology. And there are other benefits that this, the AMI system will create. You can learn more about this and those benefits if you go back to our annual meeting video that you see in front of you on our website. 
And also check out Facebook and YouTube for CECO postings where we talk more about this AMI system and other things that we're doing. How many of you in the room have heard of beneficial electrification? Not you, Mike. <laughs> you are in the room. Thanks for that. Well, you probably haven't. That's a catchphrase. It's a catchphrase. Um, and what it is, is it's, a, it says, it's really stating that the, in the energy world where we are, it refers to the growing recognition that using clean electricity to keep our homes and businesses running is cheaper, it's greener, and it is a smarter way to meet our energy needs. Now, one area of focus on this that's very popular and I know you're familiar with electric transportation and electric mobility, EVs. Any, any EV owners in the room? Wow, okay, good. So electric mobility is among the most popular forms of this term, this catchphrase, beneficial electrification. Here in the Sunshine State, we have the second highest number of EVs in the nation. We're second only to California that has 425,000 EVs on the road. We have about 60,000 here in Florida. <clears throat> so SECO's most recent residential demographic survey showed that 4% of our members already own an EV, and another 6% indicates that they have plans to purchase an EV in the next few years. When I look for the show of hands, 4% is about right from what I saw in the crowd. So interest in, in, in EVs is growing, but we hear from members who are concerned about charger availability. You gotta charge them. And you don't see as many charging stations as we, as we do gas stations, particularly during hurricane evacuations. If folks are trying to get to, from point A to point B, you need to have a charged battery if you go that route. So SECO, along with the state, rec recognize that we have to prepare for this potential dilemma. And we're closely monitoring federal funding that recently became available to help to assist in this endeavor. Florida's major highways could see 100 new fast chargers, thanks to the Department of Energy, to the Department of Energy. Florida's share of the five billion federal dollars that have been allocated to expand EV chargers nationwide, we're on tap to get about 29 million of those dollars here in the state of Florida. And that is the third most nationwide. So SECO Energy plans to be a part of this effort that is to expand the public EV charging network across the state. Now, while public charging is essential uh, to us having an, a, a good transition to away from the internal combustion engines that most of us drive today to EVs, there has to be an overwhelming majority of EV charging activity happening in another place and that is in the home. We see a lot of that, then if you were to do a poll today, most of that charging that happens is done in the home and within the confines and the convenience of where you live. So for everyday commuters like you, like me, switching to electric vehicles is a viable and increasingly popular action that we, we might consider taking to uh, to lower our, our, our mobility costs as well as our maintenance costs that we, we go through with the internal combustion engines. So with gas prices soaring, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to pass, drive past the drive station, the gas station, on your way home where you can just plug in and you can have your own EV home-based charger right there in your garage, in your driveway. So what are we doing at SECO? SECO is developing an EV charging program that will offer incentives, enabling members to simply plug in, refuel right there at home at a much lower cost than you would pay at the gas station. The program will be ready to roll out later this year. So if you're a SECO Energy member, keep an eye out on our website and our SECO news publication for updates on this program. It's coming. Now that we've talked about reliability, system improvements, technology developments that are in the works, did you know that Lake County has the highest number 
of member-owned solar installations of any of the seven counties we serve? You're number one. So CECO, altogether, we have about 3,200 arrays, and that number is increasing daily. For CECO members thinking about investing in solar for your home or your business, for that matter, just know that we employ energy services specialists who will consult with you to help you determine if your home or your business location is well suited for solar production. Just send us an email at, to solar at secoenergy.com or just give us a call and we'll provide a phone or an online is, uh, assessment and we'll follow that up with an on-site study if that is needed. But buyers, if you're heading in, heading in that direction, beware. There are scams, there are frauds that are running rampant. And they're happening every day. So don't become a victim. Investing in a solar system does not eliminate your electric bill, and despite what others might tell you. So if, if you don't have a battery or if you don't have uh, or some type of generator, you will still purchase utility supplied power at night, on cloudy days, or during hot summer afternoons during storm season, and on those cold winter mornings before the sun rises. So now is a good time uh, for me to remind you that the Atlantic hurricane season is right on the horizon. Seco uh, Energy is storm ready and we're prepared. And we're prepared for anything that comes with this upcoming hurricane season that begins June 1st. I have a short video for you today about the Storm Center, and this is our outage reporting. This is where our outage reporting and communications platform takes place. And it is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to report power outages, check the status of a current outage, and report area light issues. So if you would, uh, let us roll the video for you. Storm Center consists of six user-friendly platforms to communicate with our members about outages. It is mobile device friendly with interactive maps and a variety of notification options. The interactive map displays current outages, estimated time of restoration, crew status, start time, number of members affected, and outage cause when it's available. Use the weather overlay to see incoming storms. Check the status of an existing outage by clicking on the icon on the map. It's easy to report a new outage or check the status of an existing one. Just use your last name and house number to identify the location and click submit. It's that easy. Thank you. Thank you for that. So to complement our storm ready approach to hurricane season, Seco Energy invests heavily in an outage reduction through our vegetation management program. Um, our budget for vegetation management has increased over 300% over the past 20 years. And today, this year, we're planning to invest just roughly over $25 million through veg vegetation management. That is a big number. Uh, and that's for removing and trimming trees that get too close to the power line that can cause outages to occur. We have, thank goodness, a very comprehensive approach to vegetation management. And this program greatly reduces the number of tree-related power outages each year. The restoration times from danger trees and outages are lengthy because you've got to cut them, you've got to remove them. And we often must call on tree trimming contractor crews to, to the scene to safely remove those trees before the electric res restoration work can even start. So that's a big problem for us that we have to take, take it, make major investments in to make sure we, we, don't, we mitigate that as much as possible. Now, one of our most popular programs is speaking related to outages and, and, and storms is our surge mitigator lease or purchase program. Surgio, the, mitig the, the, the mitigator, takes the bite out of dam damaging surges and spikes that can damage appliances and electronic electronics in your home. So one more video for you. If you would watch our video about surge mitigator program and how it can save members the unnecessary financial loss of, of damaged appliances and, and things inside of your home. One more video. 
Are you protected from electrical surges? SECO Energy members live in the lightning capital of the United States. Surges, or sudden increases in voltage, are frequently caused by lightning and other unpredictable events. They can enter through power lines and lead to costly repairs. Surges happen fast, literally faster than the blink of an eye. But SECO Energy's surge mitigator chops down on surges before they enter your home. The surge mitigator is installed at the meter and protects large motor appliances like your refrigerator, air conditioner compressor, washer, dryer, stove, and so much more. Using the surge mitigator in conjunction with plugging electronics into point-of-use surge protectors greatly reduces the chances of having your expensive appliances and technology damaged by surge. If damages are incurred, the mitigator's robust warranty can help cover the cost of repair or replacement. Less than $6 a month for most residential installations is a small price to pay for the added peace of mind provided by the surge mitigator. Visit SecoEnergy.com for more information and to enroll. Send us an email to surge at SecoEnergy.com or just pick up one of the brochures you have on, on the tables in front of you today and contact us if you're interested in that. So let, let me close by thanking the Tavares uh, Chamber members for this awesome opportunity to update you on SECO happenings. Thank you again, uh, Ms. Hatfield, for joining us. Um, I appreciate you along with our other trustees for your leadership. Uh, SECO's senior leadership team is here and they're one of the best in the business. I'm very proud of SECO's leadership team and the rest of our, our, our team who are always ready to serve our members in a big way. I'm joined today um, by some of our leadership team, Gene Kanikoski, Mike White, and John LaSalva. Uh, we're prepared to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so if, if there are any questions, we'll pause for questions at this time. And let me also thank the rest of the team who are here um, with us today and, and for all of the support uh, that you give us. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Why can't we choose what electrical company we have? <laughs> that is a very good question. I, I hope it's because you would like to have us and you don't have us, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, as in most states, uh, territorial boundaries were established several years ago. And that really determines which utility serves which area. And I think the, the, the impetus behind that is over duplication of, of, of poles, wires, what, and if we could just go wherever and the other utility wouldn't allow us, did not allow us to use their facilities, you might see two poles in some people's yards or two sets of lines and that just, I think, the wisdom of the, the powers that be, the legislature, and, and the, the leaders have, have chosen not to do that. I see Mike is not, Mike White is the, our engineer, vice president of engineering, and he has to design all of those. It would be kind of fun to have to design around some of the other, around. over and around. Yeah, but that, that's why. But I appreciate that question. I appreciate the, uh, the interest in SECO. Thank you. I think someone's... Um, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Curtis. Uh, learned a lot today. You guys have definitely been busy over the last two years. Sorry. I <clears throat> tried to take some notes on my napkin while you were speaking. So I apologize if I skip around a little bit. But one question kind of comes to mind. Uh, over the past few years, you guys have definitely seen an increase in demand for your, your services. Uh, you guys are seeing unprecedented growth for your services right now, restricted by the supply chain, restricted by labor. As your revenues increase and grow, do you see the jobs that you create and your reliance on people to increase as well, or are you more strategic about going towards more automated service, services such as M AMI that you mentioned earlier and get away from the reliance on people and more on automated services, or do you see yourself creating more jobs within the community? Right. And it's, it's dependent upon which areas. Um, in, a, in one instance, the work that our line technicians do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's very difficult to automate that. Um, what we, we see both happening. Some areas we will probably have to increase. And this change in technology will also shift the, the, the talent base that we have to have, for instance, to operate and manage an AMI system. It, the, the, the 
talent and the training that many of our employees have gotten to do, to do what they do today will, pro will, will change. So we see two or three things happening. In some areas, as the growth happens, to keep the power flowing, um, we could see increases in people needing to do that. But in other areas, we will certainly be able to, to reduce costs. And a lot of our cost is in, in labor as well as transportation. Good point. And, and excuse my ignorance, yes, but um, approximately how many people do you currently employ? We employ over 400, just over 400 employees. Wow. Um, our target, just to talk about the labor and the, the recruiting effort, our targeted number, Gene, help me out with this, I think it was around 25 or four, about 430. So about 30 positions shy of where we, we budgeted to be. And that's competition for talent. And it's not just it's certain talent we have to have. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Yes, ma'am. I noticed that every year we happen to have hurricanes in this state, and that has happened for a long, long time. And we have trees as well, which you're going to spend $25 million getting rid of. Why wouldn't you put those wires underground so that the, the poles don't fall down with the hurricanes and use that $25 million in a better way than that, uh, and then use those people to dig those Trenches, so you can put the wires underground. Did 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 um, did John LaSalle come back and to your table earlier and and plant that question? No, I've asked that question almost all no, the I, time. I, I, I'm only kidding because actually, John gave the board a presentation just this week on Monday about that potential, the proposition of doing that, and looking at the cost benefit analysis. For you to point it out as clearly as you did, there's something there that that we're looking at. All right. <laughs> well, I hope you think very hard about this because it's every single year that we have a hurricane and every single year we have power outages, which are unnecessary. I mean, I lived a long time in Europe. Everything is underground. Right. Really, yes. you should it, try it. It's prettier. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is definitely something we're contemplating and I appreciate that question. And, and it, it does make sense to closely evaluate it, which is what we're doing. Thank you. I got some notes on a napkin, too. I guess, curious, uh, tagging into that before I ask my question, are you, are you converting at all as you have that opportunity and that situation and taking down poles? Do you convert to underground, or is it more complex than that, depending on where you have to tie into? It, it is somewhat complex. Mike, you want to you wanna talk to that? Uh, please. Yeah, I mean, most of our new construction, we're about 85% underground construction system-wide. Um, in some areas, in the rural areas, we already have an overhead system. So you may see the main lines, the three-phase lines along the road, but all the services going to the homes are a mix of underground and overhead. Um, of course, any time that we can get rid of overhead lines when the opportunity arises and it's economically feasible, we'll do that. Uh, but that, that is one of the issues, is the expense of burying the lines at times makes it a financial decision of sorts. So, right. um, and with the supply chain, it becomes even more difficult because even if we wanted to, in some cases, we're constri I'm sorry, constrained in what we can purchase right now. But yeah, any time that we are out in an area and we can bury lines, we do. Thank you. I did have one question about the capacity. When you talked about EV, and we've got 60,000 cars on the road right now, and uh, how fossil fuel actually relates to that because, you know, or propane and, or liquid uh, natural gas, everything that you have to have to produce the energy that we need for electricity. What kind of capacity do we have to convert? Uh, I guess we couldn't all go to EV tomorrow, but I mean, what, how would that work? And then how will fossil fuel still be related to that? Right. So that's a very good question, one that we, we, we look at quite often. In our business, to make sure that, what was the date? Uh, I think it was November. When did we have that real cold um, snap? January 30th. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, came this huge demand to make sure we had enough power that no one had to go into what we call a brownout or, or blackout. To maintain that capacity, we, on a day like today, we're only utilizing probably half of that capacity. So what we're looking at is we develop our EV program 
figuring out how do we take advantage of that unused capacity in collaboration with EV owners. So the, the simple solution would be let's encourage EV owners not to go home at 6 o'clock in the afternoon and plug in. Peak hours. Peak hours, because that would push the capacity well beyond what we could handle. However, if, they, if the charging happened at midnight, when there's very little use of that power that we've already obligated to make sure is available, we can smooth out this, what we call the capacity curve, a demand curve. I don't want to get too technical with it, but that is where, that's one of the benefits of being a member-owned utility and having a close connection with your members to make sure that when we roll out things like that, we can do it smartly. So if we were looking at the capacity today, we'd be in trouble if, if, it, if the increase happened and everybody charged in, decided to charge during peak hours. We'd, we'd probably have some issues. But if we can figure out a way, especially with the home charging, to encourage that charging to happen off peak, I think we've got something that would make Seco Energy better. We've got something that would be cost effective for the EV owner. And it would also relieve some of the pressure of the, the company that sells us electric power. And that's something we're, we're working on. And Jeff is, is that on his radar. So uh, very good question. Thank you. Um, just wanted to go circle back to the in-ground versus pole situation. Um, when Irma came through, I lived in a subdivision that had in-ground wiring, and we were without power for a week. Um, we had huge trees. The trees fell over, and when they did, they ripped out the lines that were in the ground. So it, there's no perfect solution is what I just wanted to say. And thank you. I miss you. I had you for about 20 years. So well, I, I would love to have you back. <laughs> thank you for saying that. It, it does. It, this business with 13,000 miles of circuit, um, things are going to happen. But we do know that the number, the occurrences for underground is much less on a, on a just a routine basis. But those situations will happen. Thanks for pointing that out. Any other questions? You all have been very kind. Thank you for...